It's a universal language. The rush of adrenaline. Riding on the ragged edge. For those who will stop at nothing to go faster, it's called Mega Speed. On this episode, a day and a night of flat out throttle at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. That is a long way. This is bizarre. This is truly bizarre. Freezing your gas off in upstate New York. I like playing chess at 90 miles an hour on a frozen lake. Flipping out in Alabama. Technical difficulties. Flat on their back at the flat track. Unfortunately, they watered it a little bit too much. And George Petit pulls a fast one. How are you guys doing? January in Daytona Beach, Florida. The days are short. And the races are long. At the Rolex 24 at Daytona endurance race, it's survival of the fastest. Damage. Daytona's our Super Bowl. Your adrenaline's 110%. You're digging into everything that you got to try and win this sucker. Imagine driving with a few buddies from coast to coast, New York to LA, more than 2,600 miles. That's the equivalent of 740 laps around the Daytona International Speedway at speeds in excess of 190 miles per hour and only stopping for gas, fresh tires, and a pressing engagement in the restroom, all in 24 hours. Three drivers will play tag team in the number 10 Corvette of Wayne Taylor Racing. Max Angelelli, the Sly Veteran. It's all about ego. And the two Taylor brothers, Ricky. I don't think anybody would be happy for anything other than a win. And his kid brother, Jordan. Just you and the car on the racetrack. And this is dad, Wayne Taylor. I've driven race cars for like 40 years, and I have a great partner in Max Angelelli, who used to be my co-driver. In fact, we won the 24-hour 10 years ago here, and I'd love to see my kids win it in my team. So, uh, no pressure, kids. Oh, and this is the guy they have to beat. And for me personally, winning it five times overall, 13 times in class, tied for the most overalls, It'd be great to get number six. Scott Pruitt has won here five times. He's the overdog and chief driver for Chip Ganassi Racing. Team Ganassi are considered the favorites. Their ride, the 600 horsepower Ford EcoBoost Riley. And they have two of them competing in the race. So if one car has a problem, they have the other car. That is an advantage that we don't have. Wayne Taylor Racing is a one-car family. All their eggs are in this one sleek basket. My car, which is a Corvette, is the typical American power car. Big V8, a lot of power. It's an animal. It's brutal. The atmosphere this year here at Daytona seems to be really special. Ricky Taylor will start the race. The cars are so tough these days that you can really push for 24 hours and that the drivers have to be able to withstand it as well. Entering the grid, the rivals, the Chip Ganassi team. Scott Pruitt will take the wheel first. We're focused on race. You run a number of scenarios through your head. What turn one's gonna look like turn two? 24 hours is a long time. Travis is lead technician for Wayne Taylor Racing. This is probably our biggest race of the year. We haven't had a lot of track time to sort things out. We go out, we have two pace laps to make sure everything's fine. <laughs> I 
What couldn't go wrong? Daytona is on. An endurance race is the ultimate performance test with different classes of cars, all sharing the same track at the same time. You've got cars that are doing 200 miles an hour. You've got cars that are doing 150 miles an hour. Individual drivers are limited to four hours behind the wheel in any six hour period. And a maximum of 14 hours of the 24. There are winners for each class, but the overall winner takes the top prize. It's class warfare at high speed. The Taylor and Ganassi prototype cars are the fastest on the track. Different speeds make for a different kind of rush hour. Oh, damage. Yes, you need speed. Yes, you need a quick driver. Jordan tries to pass, but runs out of room. Look at this. They do oh. it. No, he gets out of it. First pit stop for Wayne Taylor Racing. You need people that has a brain between their ears in the time stand and in the racing car. Three, two, one. Keep pushing, keep pushing. When you go clear, clear, clear. 40 laps down. Only 700 to go. Yeah, here we go. There's a long way to go. And for Ricky Taylor. Oh, my touch! Wow! The worst is yet to come. 1,200 miles north and one parka colder on frozen Lake George in Upper New York State. It's kind of like playing chess at 90 miles an hour. It's auto ice racing with the Adirondack Motor Club. What else is there to do in the winter? You just got to dress for it, that's all. Men in cars on ice with studs. The Adirondack Club has been racing on frozen water since 1954. And not much has changed, except for the speed. Like snow cones, ice racing cars come in a variety of flavors. The super modified sprint cars are the fastest. And the coldest. High horsepower, direct drives. These guys are nuts in my mind. I mean, they're open cars. They're getting smacked in the face with wind and ice and snow. Spring cars can do 100 miles per hour. The wings generate downforce that gives the car more traction. The sideboards help in turns. Big wing, so you don't actually lift the car. You actually stay in the gap so the car sticks and goes. Dave Burnham has been racing here for 18 years. He built his Super Modified himself. I run a pretty odd car. It's not like any of the other guys' cars, so everything on it is homemade. And I made all these parts, too. The racing hasn't even started, and he's already fixing it. But Dave has an excuse. I rolled over last week, broke a bunch of stuff, missed the first race, got third in the second race, and won the feature. So. It's never over till it's over. Matt DeLorenzo is another veteran of the Super Modified class. We're all friends and competitors right now, but when we put our seatbelts on, you know, we're, we're not friends anymore. Time to button up the thermal underwear. Gentlemen, start your defrosters. The first rule of ice racing, no white cars. When you hit a white out, it's pretty scary. If there's somebody ahead of you, you can follow their, their flag light and, and hopefully they know where they're going. Sometimes you can't see for like three seconds, which doesn't sound like a long time unless you're going 90 miles an hour. The second rule of ice racing, the track must be 12 inches thick. Actually, that might be the first rule. 
there's over 17 inches of ice here, so we're good. In road racing, the tires take the punishment. In ice racing, the road takes the thrashing. This tire is called a Menard tire. Here's your tubeless. The stud is actually molded into the rubber. These are basically motorcycle studs that they use on motorcycles and ATVs. Those studs bite deep. I think one year we used the same track twice in a row. We went through six or eight inches of ice or more at one corner. Nine supermods have qualified for the fight. For sure. While the slow pokes go home. You're good. The finalists make some last minute adjustments. Joe Lyons in the number two car is starting third. I'd stay with the two leaders and try to pass them. Uh, hey, go fast. <laughs> now, it's time for the icing on the lake, the championship run. The radio tracks the leader. Number 48, the yellow sprint car. Dave is in front, but Joe is close behind in number two. Good to go this time, buddy. It's down to a car length, and that ain't much. Joe nearly nips by, but gets tangled in traffic with slower, less studly cars. Checkered flag, then takes the flag for a victory lap. And I was pushing it for all it had. You know, 7,000 RPM practically the whole way. That's the way they do it in the Adirondacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hard racing, but no hard feelings. Still ahead on mega speed, a car at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And up next, bouncing on the rocks in Backwoods, Alabama. Deep in the backwoods of Alabama. It's Southern Rock Racing's Gray Rock event where you can kiss your springs goodbye. Pretty violent. Kind of like a 30-second car wreck. It's different than anything you've ever seen. Clyde Bynum runs the show. Rock bouncing is guys that are in buggies, kind of like monster trucks. Some of them get to the top. Some of them don't. It's the first stop in the rock bouncing season. The driver with the most points will win $10,000. The main event is a torturous vertical trench of boulders and mud called Cable Hill. Tim Cameron is a champion bouncer. He knows Cable Hill well. Starts off small. Four, five, six inch ledges. Gets to the top, two and three foot. Get to the very end, it's about a five foot ledge. Even with 500 horsepower and custom tires, the buggies struggle for grip. Here's the objective. 
the fastest guy to the top wins. It's like watching salmon on the spawn. Angry salmon. On this particular hill, once they get up there at the top and they stop, they've lost all their forward momentum. This, this hill's all horrible for carnage. Technical difficulties. Never goes as planned. All my blood's in my head a little bit, but that's all right. Tim's waiting for his turn. But this guy's up next. Bobby Tanner is Tim's rival. He's won here before. When you take off, if you're not committed, you're not going to climb it. Bobby Tanner, clock is hot. Bobby comes up blazing, but Cable Hill fights back. The clock keeps ticking. One more try. Slick, wet, it is rough. Probably the roughest than I've had up through there. After several hours of burning engines. We have a fire, get on it now. We have a fire, get on it now. Burning rubber. And flying mud. 50 buggies have taken on Cable Hill. We've had a lot of carnage, which is about normal. Last time we were on this hill, only six made it out the top. So far, we've had six make it out the top. Race master Clyde's son, CJ, is taking it one step at a time. But the last step may break him. CJ Bynum makes it seven to the top. That's what I'm talking about. There's not very many buggies that climbed it, so we're getting we're getting good points off that, yeah. but as far as time, we don't know. But only one can be fastest. Tim has been waiting all day for his shot to beat Bobby Tanner's 46 second mark. Uh, I, I ran a 27 second on the first course. I believe that was for third. Tim heads down to the launch pad. Tim makes it look easy. One six point four one nine. One six point four one nine. He conquers Cable Hill in just over sixteen seconds. I'm here to drill rush. Don't uh, don't get no better than that. As long as my buggy it ain't hurt. As far as I can tell, it looks like all four tires still on it, so that's a good plus. At the end of the day, even the losers feel like winners. Because in rock bouncing, you got nothing to lose but your marbles. Coming up. Flying flat out at flat track. And Eric Barone's Tour de Chance. So the last time we saw the great French stunt driver, Eric Barone, he was at the top of a volcano in Nicaragua and going downhill fast. Rowe was attempting to break the world speed record for a bicycle. Unfortunately, Eric's bicycle became two unicycles. 13 years and a new super duper bicycle later, Eric has a new venue, a softer cushion and thinner air. 
with a stiffy red suit and a helmet only Buck Rogers could love. He sets the new world speed record for a bicycle on snow at 223.30 kilometers per hour. And his bike stayed in one piece. Eric Barone is back on top of the world. The Daytona Flat Track is the premier event of the American Motorcycle Association Flat Track Series. Flat Track is many things. It's keeping up front and staying there. It's about hitching the wrong kind of ride. We ain't got no rear view mirrors, so you gotta look ahead, but also prepare for what's behind you. It's about hanging tough in the back of the pack. And sometimes it's just hanging on for dear life. Most tracks are banked to prevent minnows. There's nothing to bank on here. The name of the game is oversteer. The left leg is a sliding kickstand at 130 miles per hour. It is brutal as it is fast. Jared Meese is the defending champion of the flat track circuit. He gets to wear the number one, and he wants to keep it that way. I've seen guys at Daytona win the main event the night before, not even make the main event the next day. So uh, hopefully we're not, we're not in that predicament. A series of heats leads up to the championship race. 25 laps over a quarter mile over. So far, the Daytona event isn't going his way. After two nights of racing, Jared, hasn't won a heat. You know, it was a tough track to pass on. It really was. It was really one line. And I was waiting for a mistake, and it just didn't happen. Shayna Taxter knows how Jared feels. She's won her share of flat track races, but Daytona isn't doing her any favors. Some days I have an advantage because I'm light. Shayna is a triumph of spirit over biology. Some days it's definitely a disadvantage, like this little short track here that we're running. Uh, being that I'm five foot tall, right around 100 pounds, uh, you know, the average guy out there is probably 5'6", five, 5'7", five, 140. Or maybe it's just good genes. My dad raced, my grandfather raced. It's just a part of who we are. Uh, my family owned a Harley shop since like 1952, so uh, motorcycles, flat track racing, uh, you know, it's just a part of who I am. This is the last race before the flight. The track is super slippery. But Jared is holding on. Second place, but a distant second. You get a run on somebody, but then as soon as you go to pull out off the groove, it was just spinning and you lose all kinds of traction. Sheena is at the back of the pack. Unfortunately for me, I ran the entire race with no brakes. Neither Jared or Shayna gets the flag. The track gets a haircut before the final race. And then some gel to slick things up. Jared will start the race at fifth position. Shayna is back in the third row. Jared's falling further behind. Riders are dropping like flies. It's a two-wheel jungle up there. Definitely, in all forms of motorsports, there's definitely tracks that riders favor and dislike. Now it's Shayna's turn to get the dirt. Shayna jumps in to help her fellow riders. The race is back on. Jared is battling back. He's worked his way to second.
but no dice. Jared finished upright, but in the wrong position. Second place. In the main event, I lost about three or four positions there. It was just really tough to make up time, you know? Unfortunately, they tried to make the track better and uh, made it a little bit worse. Flat track is many things, but mostly, it's humbling. Sometimes, you have to smile like you mean it. Coming up, engineered to perfection. And with 12 hours left to race, a little me time. Ah, oh, feel good. At the Rolex 24 at Daytona, it's past midnight. And we're live from the Daytona International Speedway, Rolex 24. Even the fans have gone home, except for the campers. After eight hours, the cars have traveled the distance from New York to Florida. The Taylor brothers and their co-driver, Max Angelelli, are keeping a championship base. Jordan Taylor with a drive off turn six. But so are the two cars of Chip Ganassi Racing, and both Ganassi cars are ahead. Yes, Ganon, the O2 car is currently P2. In the Ford, Scott Pruitt has the hammer down. Scott, you're the leader. An endurance race is all about pace. Drivers are limited to 14 hours behind the wheel, and no more than four hours in a six-hour stretch. Your body's giving up. You're, you're absolutely destroyed. It's the hardest race in the world. Drivers and crews need to chill when they can. Loosen those belts. Get ready for driver change. It's Scott's turn for some R&R. It's about 2 o'clock. It's past 2 o'clock now. I'll be in probably 7 a.m., 7, 8, 7, 8 o'clock, something like that. Ah, oh, I feel good. Scott's rival is this man. No, 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 not him. The man getting the massage. Max Angelilli works out some deep tissues. Feeling good, but the best part is still to come. I want to have everything in place. I don't want to forget mistakes and uh, learn from it and make sure that I'm not going to do it again. Inside, another one inside. Clear. While Max gets the squeeze, Jordan watches his brother Ricky in a pinch. I can't say that I can go much faster. If Ricky can't catch the Ganassi cars, Jordan will have to drive that much faster when it's his turn at the wheel. In Perth, Australia, behind every fast driver, there's an even faster engineer. OK, guys, today we're going to do a full comp simulation. These student engineers from Edith Cowan University think they have the right stuff. The team has designed and built an open-wheel race car from the ground up. The car's design and performance will be tested in a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle with the top engineering schools in Australia and Asia. Their number one rival is just miles away. There's about 600 teams around the world, and one of the very best teams that we compete against in Australia is right up there, and we're really desperate to knock them off their perch. Until we've caught them, we're not going to rest, and even when we've caught them, we're going to want win after win after win. Each school is limited to a total budget of $25,000, and that includes everything from design to production. We've nicknamed the car Emma, and we've got a custom engine in it. We use a CBR 600 Honda that we've uh, designed and manufactured ourselves. I mean, there's not many racing series in the world that design and build their own engines. We run a carbon fibre chassis. Not many forms of motorsport have carbon fibre chassis. Dan is the team's driver, and he begins by thrashing the car through the cones. Dan's going out, putting his car to its absolute limits. So we're testing the geometry, how the car's handling. 
noticing a lot of body roll in the car, which probably means we need to go a lot stiffer. As you can see him come through here, it is quite stiff on the front. It seems to be lifting some of the front wheels, but it, we're really struggling at the moment for rear end grip. Emma is light and only 200 kilograms, but she cranks out 80 horsepower. In the competition, she'll be tested for agility, endurance, and raw speed. We're down here doing an acceleration run. So we're testing the accelerational speed of our car. We're against a uh, Elfin, Australian sports car. It gives us a really good comparison. Our custom-built race car versus another custom-built race car. The Elfin is a well-respected race car with a long reputation for going fast. Emma just destroys it off the line. Not even close. It's pretty clear they've got the acceleration down pat. Now it's time to compare performance to last year's entry. Emma, meet Watson. This year's entry is faster on the straights, but still a little loose in the corners. When we're in the UK, there was um, Formula One teams there having a look, trying to find their, their next engineers for the future. So it's extremely serious. When you're building a car from scratch, and you have to be very serious in what you're doing. They finished third last time out. That is not an option this year. We're going for the win. Um, I don't think we ever turn up to a competition where we don't think we're going to win. I mean, that's why we're here. Watch out for these blokes in the pits at a future Formula One race. Coming up, Troy Ladd's Hollywood Dream Machines. 1949, 1950, this was as good as it got. And up next, George Petit, it's a mega speed bump. When it comes to setting speed records, George Petit is a repeat offender. On the Bonneville Salt Flats, George and his 2,000 horsepower speed demon set the land speed record for piston-powered wheel-driven vehicles, 439 miles per hour. So of course, George did what any red-blooded maniac does after he breaks a speed record. He set out to break it again. Three miles in at 370 miles per hour, the Speed Demon did a bit of a roll. The car will need a fresh coat of paint, as for 66-year-old George, he walked away with some bruises. No doubt, he'll be back to break more records rather than bones soon. Hollywood. It's called the Dream Factory. But dreams aren't just for movies. Live from a small garage in Burbank, California, Troy Ladd brings four-wheeled fantasy to reality. Troy is the driving force of Hollywood Hot Rods. The logical evolution of what we do is we're taking cars that exist, we modify them for design and customize them, um, you know, hot rod for speed and customs for, for design. From this automobile DNA, Troy and his artisans let their imagination take over. Anybody can go buy some Ferrari or something from a dealership and there's gonna be a thousand other guys that have the same Ferrari. This car, we're building by hand, you watch it. As the customer, you watch it being built for you. There's only one like it. These are the earthly remains of a 1937 Packard Roadster. In its day, it was one of the most coveted cars in America. We do call it a Packard because it's 80% handmade, 20% Packard. So this is a unique way to have something special that no one else has. Troy is fanatical about detail. His goal is not historical accuracy. For him, the end result has to be better than the real thing. It didn't exist in this era, but we design it as if it could have been in that era. And you can see in plan view, the entire chassis is shaped like a figure eight. So even the mechanical elements we make artistically. 
This idea was taken from a, a Bugatti race car. A lot of this design, this mesh, the, the straps, that's very European sports car of the era. But we thought it matched the era of this car as if it could have been. Like, okay, that didn't exist in 1936, but can we design something that could have, that would look like it did? A lot of dimensions of the car have moved. Um, and therefore, all of this is made by hand. You can see that we made these hinges that kind of look mechanical. I personally like things that are mechanical and functional. All these little styling changes, we, we love to move metal. That's our thing. All this stuff has to roll together into a complete artistic package. It's just this crazy art project, if you will. All of these are hot rods. You take a small car with no weight, put a big engine in it, it goes fast. It's pretty simple. Which takes us to the car Troy is driving. So this is a 1932 Ford Roadster that we just finished. 32 is the quintessential hot rod. And this one's a perfect example of a vintage version of it. It's a suicide door car, which it w this car wouldn't have been, but that's based on a 32 Ford Coupe. This stuff is all custom, but it matches and enhances the, the design of the car. These are Buick brake drums with fin aluminum backing plates. Obviously, disc brakes work better in a modern world. The drums work just fine, but they're beautiful. But it functions as well, too. The engine is unbelievable. Uh, Ford flathead with Navarro aluminum heads, SCOT polished blower, 97 Strombergs. It is state-of-the-art race car performance for 1949, 1950. This was as good as it got. For a hot rod guy with a traditional car, you really want that traditional performance feel. So for this car, this is the ultimate engine. And it's a thing of beauty. It looks like a jewel in the engine compartment. The customers that buy our cars like to drive. And they're willing to pay supercar prices. They have to function as well as they look. What better place than Hollywood for a hot rod like this? After all, you wouldn't want to be caught dead in one of those boring Ferraris. At Daytona International Speedway, after more than 12 hours of flat out racing, it's four o'clock in the morning. Wayne Taylor, do you know where your kids are? All three of them, all three of them. Wayne Taylor's two sons, Ricky and Jordan, are looking to win the crown jewel of American endurance racing, the Rolex 24 at Daytona. You know, because they're my kids, it sounds like I'm biased, but I think they're the quickest drivers on the track. I really do. Their veteran co-driver, Max Angelelli, is holding second place. On the GPS monitor, the black number 10 is Max in the Corvette. It's just amazing if you think about it. What we mean in the other hour, and we're all within seconds. The purple number 02 is the Ford of Chip Ganassi Racing. They have two cars. You know, we have one, so we've got to be careful. We're going to push them hard. Max is coming into the pits for a driver change. Five, four, three, two, one. Ricky Taylor takes over. There's our six low right now. Max has issues with the Corvette. High performance cars have 21st century problems. Its traction control system is on the frets. It takes a SWAT team of geeks to analyze its stats. We have a long way to go and uh, we're looking good. Our car is fast, even with, with our traction control, so I'm optimistic. But the glitch is costly. Jordan is battling to get out of sixth place. Anything can happen. I mean, it's all about the guys that we have going over the wall, getting the job done, and the guys on the timing stand making the right calls. With 16 hours left to go, it's anybody's race still. Look at that beautiful that orange starting to come up. Gorgeous. Just... It's been a long, fast night. My oh. brain is completely fried. <laughs> From about the 18 hour mark on, it turns out to a battle to the end. There's not going to be any breaks from here on out. 
All this racing takes its toll. Scott Pruitt's out with a broken clutch. And other drivers have simply hit the wall. With just 20 minutes remaining, the race is stopped because of an accident. We had a car stop. The driver is safe, but the car is a barbecue. Wayne Taylor Racing is in second place. The yellow caution flag means the cars will be bunched together, giving the team a golden opportunity. left in the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Wayne Taylor Racing's Corvette is just three tenths of a second behind the Chip Ganassi Racing Team's Ford. Jordan Taylor with a drive off turn six. He may be close enough to get something done this time. Even the pit lane is a battlefield. Oh, oh. and they touch. Wow. As we get closer to the end, track conditions are changing, grip levels are changing. It's making it harder for the drivers to really know what they have. 10 cars looking awfully, awfully strong right now. But something's gone wrong, and it's not the car. Co-pilot Max Angelelli has a sinking feeling. I believe we exceeded the maximum uh, driving time for one of the drivers, I believe. 10 minutes to go. It's going to kill us. Jordan gets the bad news over the radio. Yes, I need you to pit now. Pit now. Did you need me to pit? All we're going to do is a driver change here. A driver's change with only minutes left? This is bizarre. This is truly bizarre. It's not going to be happy. Uh, it's coming in. He's in the pit. Well, the only thing I can think is that they suddenly realize that Jordan's up against the 14-hour time limit. Jordan's broken the time limit for drivers. Jordan looked confused when he got out, just the body language at least. There's two rules. You can do no more than four hours in any six-hour period, right. and then you can't do any more than 14 hours within the 24-hour you know, like race. He... With one lap to go, they don't have time to catch up. Chip Ganassi's number two car hangs on to win. Wayne Taylor Racing, third. We come here to win it. We spent a lot of time wanting to win this thing. And uh, when you go out with uh, mistakes that we made, it makes it harder. It sounds like a good result, you know, 24 hours, over 60 cars. It's terrible. We lost. While the champs show off their brand new Rolex watches, a distraught Wayne Taylor can only blame himself. We ran Jordan too long in a car in a certain period of time. That's against the rules. And um, I have no words to say. Oh, sorry. I On the podium, in third place, Wayne's sons and Max put on brave faces. It gets worse. A week later, the team is officially disqualified from the race. Jordan broke the four-hour maximum. The team lost its third place finish. Why do you guys do this to yourself? I mean, it looks to, me, to us, it looks like you're winners. I mean, you don't win every race, but you're doing something that isn't easy. Why, why do you do it? You love it. love it. This is the first race of the series. There is a whole season to get their clocks in order. It's racing. Absolutely. Start all over. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Meanwhile, Lake George keeps on freezing. We love it, so we come out here and keep doing it. Emma and Watson continue to jockey for position when it comes to engineering excellence. Shayna Texter's ready for her next flat track challenge. You know, I'm just happy to walk away healthy and uh, get ready for Springfield. Troy Ladd is forging his next miracle. We're getting this, you know, mid early 60s hot rod feel. And the Alabama rock bouncers are exploring new heights. 